Paul Simon is one of the greatest North American songwriters of all time, worthy of mention in the same breath as legends like Bob Dylan, Smokey Robinson, Joni Mitchell, Stevie Wonder, Leonard Cohen, Chuck Berry, George Gershwin, Neil Young, Cole Porter, Irving Berlin and Hank Williams. During a recording career that spans an epic 66 years so far, and yielded five Simon & Garfunkel studio albums and 15 solo albums, Simon has written countless all-time classic songs. His songs feature lyrics that can be enigmatic, arresting, surprising, funny and more, but that are always very perceptive about the human condition. Simon has a talent for memorable one-liners like, losing love is like a window to your heart, and who is going to love you when your looks are gone. Hello Darkness My Old Friend is one of the most famous opening lines in music history. Simon's melodies sometimes have a serpentine quality that can take a moment to connect, with rhythmic phrasing that is consistently inventive and unpredictable, but they can also be very direct and instantly catchy. His lyrics and melodies are also supported by ingenious use of harmonies, arrangements, rhythms and production that grew more complex over the course of his career. Simon has been called America's most intelligent songwriter, and his most well-known songs include The Sound of Silence, Homeward Bound, Mrs. Robinson, The Boxer, Bridge Over Troubled Water, America, Kodachrome, Fifty Ways to Leave Your Lover, Still Crazy After All These Years, You Can Call Me Owl, Graceland, The Boy in the Bubble, Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes, father and daughter, and many more. Simon has not only given the world countless great songs, he's also an outstanding singer, guitarist, arranger, producer, and musical innovator. Simon was a pioneer of the American folk scene that emerged in the early 60s. And with Garfunkel, he was among the first to use electric instruments and studio effects in the initially entirely acoustic genre. In the 70s, Simon was an early innovator when he blended folk, reggae, rock, jazz, gospel, soul, and other genres. And his most famous and popular album, Graceland, mixes European and American styles with African music. All this led to Simon winning an amazing 16 Grammy Awards, including three Album of the Year Awards for Bridge Over Troubled Water in 1970, Still Crazy After All These Years in 1975, and Graceland in 1986. Simon has also achieved a Lifetime Achievement Grammy Award, was entered into the Grammy Hall of Fame and inducted twice into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, in 1990 as part of Simon and & Garfunkel and in 2001 for his solo career. In 2006, Time magazine declared him one of the 100 people who shaped the world. In short, Paul Simon is amongst the most celebrated and influential musicians who ever lived. The recent release of his 15th solo album, Seven Psalms, which we will cover in another video, is a good reason to highlight Simon's entire career. Still crazy after all these years. Paul Frederick Simon was born on October the 13th, 1941, in Newark, in New Jersey, to Jewish parents. His father, Louis, was a college professor, as well as a double bass player and the leader of a jazz group. He was a major influence on the young Simon's musical development. His mother, Belle, was a schoolteacher. Simon grew up in Queens, New York City, and was interested in baseball and music, particularly the jazz his father was playing, but also in folk, doo-wop, and soul. He met Art Garfunkel when he was 11, and the two began singing together. Garfunkel had a tape recorder, which they used to record and develop their harmony singing. In 1954, Simon heard Elvis Presley for the first time, when his song That's All Right was played on a car radio. Presley and his music changed American youth culture and had a strong impact on Simon as well. He began to play the guitar as a result because he wanted to become a rock and roll star. Garfunkel was equally inspired by the new rock and roll music, now using two tape recorders, and also inspired by the Everly Brothers. The teenagers continued to work on their singing and harmonies. The first song Simon wrote was called The Girl For Me, and Garfunkel and he performed it live in 1955 at junior high school. Thinking of a girl, it went like this. The girl for me is standing there 
A year later, they took on the name Tom and Jerry, and in 1957 they recorded a song written by Simon called Hey Schoolgirl, which was released on Big Records. It sold 100,000 copies and went to number 49 on the Billboard chart. They also performed the song on the popular TV show American Bandstand. Further releases flopped, and Simon and Garfunkel each went on their own way, with the former studying English at Queen's College and the latter architecture at Columbia University. While studying at Queen's College, Simon met Carole King, who revived his interest in pursuing a career in the music industry. Outside of college hours, Simon worked hard on writing songs and recording demos. Simon briefly joined a student band called Tico and the Triants, and one single written by him, Motorcycle, made it to number 99 in the charts in 1961. He also released a number of solo singles under various pseudonyms, including Paul Kane, True Taylor, and Jerry Landis. They all sank without trace, apart from the Lone Teen Ranger, which reached number 97 in 1962. Simon graduated from college in 1963 and became involved in the burgeoning folk scene in Greenwich Village, as well as the emerging American counterculture. He auditioned for Columbia producer Tom Wilson, who had worked with Bob Dylan. When Wilson suggested the tracks Simon played would work better in a small group, Simon reached out to Art Garfunkel, and Wilson signed them as a duo. Now operating under the name Simon and Garfunkel, the duo's debut album, Wednesday Morning 3am, was recorded at Columbia Studios in March 1964. Tom Wilson was the producer, and Columbia staff engineer Roy Halley engineered. Halley would go on to play a pivotal role in Paul Simon's career. When Simon and Garfunkel, who were not called Simon and Garfunkel at the time, auditioned for Columbia Records, the engineer who was our recorded the audition was Roy Halley. And he said, if you sign those guys, I would love to be their engineer. I had just broken into Columbia Records as a mixer, and I was assigned to do their audition. Only four of the 11 tracks were Paul Simon originals. The title track, Bleecker Street, he Was My Brother and The Sound of Silence. The latter would, of course, go on to become one of the most famous songs of all time, and we have devoted a separate video to the song. Simon later dedicated He Was My Brother to former friend and classmate Andrew Goodman, who was one of the three civil rights activists murdered in June of 1964, in a case that attracted nationwide attention, and was used by President Lyndon B. Johnson to push through the 1964 Civil Rights Act. When the album was released in October of 1964, it carried the subtitle, Exciting New Sounds in the Folk Tradition. Wednesday morning, 3 a.m., sold badly. And the commercial failure led Garfunkel to return to his university studies, while Simon moved to England in 1965. Simon spent most of the year performing in folk clubs around the country. He also produced an album by Jackson C. Frank, which became an influence on many other folk musicians. And he worked with the Australian folk band The Seekers. Because he needed money, he wrote a song called Red Rubber Ball with Bruce Widley from The Seekers in exchange for an advance of £100. Because Simon became popular in the English folk scene, CBS asked him to record a solo album. The recording sessions took place at Levi's recording studio during June of 1965 and were produced by Reginald Warburton and Stanley West. All songs were recorded with just one microphone for Simon's vocals and acoustic guitar. He Was My Brother and The Sound of Silence were again included, as well as several other songs that would later be re-recorded by Simon and Garfunkel. The Paul Simon songbook was released in August of 1965 to general disinterest, and with Wednesday 3am also having bombed, Simon might have been forgiven for thinking his career was going nowhere. However, around the time he was recording his solo album, DJs of radio stations in Boston and in Florida had noticed the world-class quality of the song The Sound of Silence on Wednesday 3am and began playing it to enthusiastic reactions from radio listeners. When Tom Wilson, the producer of Wednesday Morning 3am, heard about this, he overdubbed two electric guitars, electric bass and drums to the track with musicians from Bob Dylan's studio band. Roy Halley also added a lot of echo, as was common at the time in releases of the emerging folk rock genre. The new folk rock version was released on September the 12th, almost a year after the release of the initial acoustic version, and immediately started to climb up the Billboard singles charts. <laughs> 
Simon had no idea that was happening until he picked up a copy of Billboard magazine during a visit to Denmark and was surprised to find his song in the Hot 100. A copy of the single was sent to him and while Simon intensely disliked the overdubbed version, he soon made his way back to the US to reconnect with Garfunkel and help promote the single. By the end of the year, it had gone to number Simon and Garfunkel had made it big. Keen to build on the success of the single, Columbia asked Simon and Garfunkel to quickly record a second album. Over the course of just four days in December, with producer Bob Johnson, who had also worked with Bob Dylan, and once again engineer Roy Halley, Simon and Garfunkel recorded eight songs. Several of them were re-recordings of songs on Simon's solo album. They were supported by a crew of elite session musicians, consisting of Glenn Campbell, Fred Carter Jr. and Joe South on guitars, Larry Nechtel on keyboards, Joe Osborne on bass guitar and Hal Blaine on drums. There were members of the loose collective called The Wrecking Crew. During this time, Halley, Simon and Garfunkel stumbled on the duo's characteristic vocal sound. We would sing a take together on mic, on one mic, and when we got the take that we wanted, then we would double it individually. The resulting album was called Sounds of Silence. The album is also notable for Simon's version of Davy Graham's guitar instrumental, Angie, which demonstrated Simon's prowess on acoustic guitar. Sounds of Silence reached to number 21, and the song Simon had co-written for The Seekers Red Rubber Ball also became a big hit in the US, going to number two in the Billboard singles charts. Simon and Garfunkel, as well as Columbia, were acutely aware that they needed to continue the momentum, and the duo started work on a third album in the beginning of 1966. Rather than rush the process, as they had done with the second album, this time Simon and Garfunkel, again assisted by producer Bob Johnston and engineer Roy Hiley, spent several months at Columbia Studios, taking extensive care over the arrangements and production. The session musicians included, again, Hal Blaine, Joe South, and Larry Nachtel, who had all performed on the previous album, as well as bassist Carol Kay. Cost for the album ballooned to a, for the time, unheard of $30,000, around $280,000 in today's terms. The album was the duo's first to be recorded to 8-track using Columbia Studios' own custom-made consoles. As Halley recalled in an interview, it was Columbia equipment, which some of the groups were not particularly crazy about, to be very honest. I liked working out of there, but the union was a little strangling creatively. If you wanted to do something really strange with a lot of machines, they didn't like it. If I had four or five tape machines running with echoes and reverbs, because we didn't have any digital delays in those days, of course, I'd line them up in the hallway of the studio. The union didn't like that. What do you need all those machines for? They almost threw me out for doing that type of thing. Simon and Garfunkel's third album, Parsley, Sage, Rosemary and Time, was released in October of 1966. It contains several tracks that have since become classics, most notably the English traditional song, Scarborough Affair which Simon had learned from leading English folk singer Martin Carthy when he was in London, and Homeward Bound. The album was a commercial success, reaching to number four in the US and number 13 in the UK, and going three times platinum in the US. Simon and Garfunkel toured extensively and also appeared on various popular TV shows. In 1967, film director Mike Nichols asked the duo to write songs for a film he was shooting, which became The Graduate. Nichols rejected several songs Simon offered, but adored an unfinished song which became known as Mrs. Robinson and became closely associated with the movie. The movie's soundtrack was produced by Teo Massaro, famous for his work with Miles Davis and also featured The Sound of Silence, as well as three other songs from previous Simon and Garfunkel albums. Released in January of 1968, the soundtrack album went to number one in the US. Simon and Garfunkel were now one of the biggest acts in the world and kept their enormous momentum going with their fourth album, Bookends, which was released just a few months after the Graduate soundtrack in April of 1968. This time Roy Halley was promoted to co-producer with the duo. Halley's role with Simon and Garfunkel became similar to that of George Martin with the Beatles, 
Roy Halley was the driver in many of these things because at this point in our lives, we were moving from the song to the record, and the record is sound itself. However, as Halley explained, Paul had just about total control. Artie was more into the vocal backgrounds, the pretty harmonies, etc. But Paul was the writer, and he really had a vision for what he thought we should do. Still, he would bounce ideas off of us. He'd come into the studio and say, what do you think of this? And he'd play something, and Artie would say what he thought. And I'd say what I thought, and we'd go from there. Halley's input, particularly with the reverb effects, was considerable, as Paul Simon explains here. He's one of the great engineers of his time, and, uh, and a genius with echo. And he would play around with echo all, you know, all the time. You come into the studio, he'd say, listen to, li listen to this. Simon played all the guitars on the album, and the Wrecking Crew session musicians this time were Hal Blaine, Joe Osborne, and Larry Nechtel. John Simon, who had produced Red Rubber Ball, played a Moog synth on Save the Life of My Child, and there were also horns and strings. Bookends became Simon and Garfunkel's first American and British number one album. A complete version of Mrs. Robinson was released as a single from the album and became their first number one single. Other classic songs on the album include America, Overs, Faking It, A Hazy Shade of Winter, and At the Zoo. During the Grammy Awards of 1969, Simon and Garfunkel were nominated for five Grammy Awards and won three. Record of the Year, Best Contemporary Pop Performance for Mrs. Robinson, and Best Original Score written for a motion picture or television special for the soundtrack of The Graduate. A critic fittingly called bookends a once-in-a-career convergence of musical, personal and societal forces that placed Simon and Garfunkel squarely at the centre of the cultural zeitgeist of the 60s. Simon and Garfunkel were on top of the world, and it was hard to see where they could go from there. The duo did, however, manage to surpass bookends with their next and final studio album, Bridge Over Troubled Water which ended up becoming one of the most lauded and best-selling albums of all time. It went number one in dozens of countries around the world, and eight times platinum in the US and 11 times platinum in the UK. The album ended up winning six Grammy Awards and has to date sold 25 million copies. Bridge Over Troubled Water was once again co-produced by Simon Garfunkel and Halley. Recordings did not only take place at the usual Columbia studio in New York, but also for the first time in Los Angeles at CBS Columbia Square. The sessions once again featured bassist Joe Osborne, drummer Hal Blaine, and keyboardist Larry Nechtel from The Wrecking Crew, as well as many other musicians. The album was recorded in November of 1969, apart from Baby Driver and The Boxer, which had been recorded a year earlier. The Boxer became one of Simon's most famous songs and was a tour de force of arrangement and production taking about a hundred hours to record. Halley pulled out all the stops to achieve an extraordinary result. For example, he recorded the Martin 00018 baby acoustic guitar of session guitarist Fred Carter Jr. with an amazing seven microphones. Halley, Simon and Garfunkel also experimented heavily with echo. Simon and Garfunkel asked Halley to record the La 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 chorus at St. Paul's Chapel in Columbia University. All the, the La La La's were done in that chapel at Columbia University. So this meant that the field crew had to go to the chapel, set up the console, set up all the machines. Well, they thought I was totally insane, which I probably was, you know. Given that Halley loved Echo, he didn't mind being regarded as insane. And he went ahead with another seemingly crazy idea, to record the drums in the studio hallway, as he and drummer Hal Blaine explained. Columbia Records at that time had fabulous hallways. He found a place right in front of the elevator. So I set up chair, headsets, and I was smashing these two drums. A huge, humongous explosion. Halley ended up with a session that was so complicated that he convinced Columbia to buy a 16-track tape recorder. I got Columbia, by the way, to get us a 16-track machine on the strength of, I swear, this is a true story, bringing Clive Davis into the control room played the record for him, and showed him how we had to do it. We got our 16-track machine. 
Sessions continued a year later after an unexpectedly long delay due to Garfunkel having a small role in the film Catch-22. When they went back into the studio, there again was a lot of experimentation. This included the use of rhythm recorded at home on a Sony tape recorder. There's maybe six or seven people sort of just, you know, hanging out, partying. And we started, like, pounding, you know, pounding on things and make it, making, a, making a rhythm. We liked our Sony Sound on Sound tape recorder. Once we kicked on the reverb button, it gave you a kickback of every sound, quite loud and pronounced. And the kickback was a good quarter of a second. So you could play your Levi's on your thighs with your hands, as Paul and I did, into that rhythm. The tape loop became the foundation for the song Cecilia. Other experiments included recording the backing vocals for the song The Only Living Boy in New York in the echo chamber of the studio in Los Angeles, and Simon writing a song to the track made popular by Los Incas called El Condor Pasa. It was an early illustration of Simon's interest in world music, which would come to dominate a large part of his solo career. Simon regards the title song of the album as among his best work. In this television interview he did with Dick Cavett in 1970, he explains how he wrote it. The beginning of the song I had. That comes from a Bach piece. I was listening to uh, some music by a gospel group called the Swan Silvertones because I started to go to gospel changes. Simon asked Art Garfunkel to sing the lead part of the song. Although he had written the song on guitar, he wanted the main accompaniment to be played on a gospel-influenced piano. The song starts with just piano and vocals and gradually builds until drums, bass, vibraphone, strings and Simon all enter in the third verse, turning the song suddenly into a huge production. Also because of the song's nearly five minute length, Simon and Garfunkel regarded it as an album track, but Columbia director Clive Davis insisted in releasing it as a single. His instincts were right. Because the song went to number one in the US and like the album became one of the defining recordings of the era. Bridge Over Troubled Water was released in January of 1970, and the new decade heralded a dramatic change for the world and also for Simon and Garfunkel. Their fifth studio album was the first on which they sang extended sections of songs on their own, and it turned out that this mirrored their personal situation. Simon and Garfunkel had started to drift apart and decided to go their own ways soon after the album's release. They never reformed formally and have since sporadically recorded together in the studio and performed a number of Simon and Garfunkel reunion concerts, including the famous concert in Central Park in 1981. In fact, there have been occasional joint tours and appearances until 2010. However, since 1970, Simon's main focus has been on developing a solo career. There initially were doubts whether Simon could have a viable solo career, not least by himself. Unsure of what to do next, he spent some time teaching songwriting classes at New York University and also travelled extensively. He visited Jamaica and at Dynamic Sound Studio in Kingston he recorded the song Mother and Child Reunion. It features several local musicians who were working with prominent reggae acts like Jimmy Cliff and Toots and the Maytals, including organist Neville Hines, guitarist Hux Brown, bassist Jackie Jackson and drummer Winston Grennan. Mother and Child Reunion was released in January of 1972 as the lead single of his forthcoming self-titled solo album. It became a top 10 hit in many countries, including the US and the UK, and preceded other international reggae hits, meaning that Simon was ahead of the reggae wave that would soon engulf the world. No, I would not give you false hope. Roy Halley engineered and co-produced the new album, which was also recorded at CBS Studios in San Francisco and New York. United Western Recorders in Hollywood and Studio CBE in Paris. Members of the Wrecking Crew again made an appearance and there's an extensive list of guest musicians including Los Incos, Stefan Grossman, Ron Carter, Erto Moriera and Stefan Grappelli. The Latin influenced song Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard was engineered by Phil Ramone who was on his way to become one of the great legends of the American music world. He recalled in an interview I was fortunate enough to work with Paul on a single when his producer Roy Halley wasn't available. 
It was a great meeting between us. It was quite unusual how we mic'd Paul's solid body guitar. I put a mic up near his strumming hand like you would with an acoustic. Nobody did that. You were supposed to mic an electric guitar at the amp, but I liked the sound he was getting. It was so percussive. In truth, we never turned the amp on. Paul was just playing the song to show it to the band. I rolled tape. I do that all the time. I roll tape, cheapest commodity on the date. When we played it back, Paul said, I like the sound of that. Paul took chances and he gave me the chance to make errors. And sometimes these wonderful, surprising, good mistakes would work into something else. As long as I had that, I knew I could always come up with an answer to something he would request. Paul Simon was released in January of 1972 and went to number one in the UK and number four in the US. The two next singles taken from the album, Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard and the ballad Duncan, which features Los Incas, also were successful. With most of the music more low key and introspective than the first two singles, the album as a whole was well received by critics. There was speculation that the album sounded as if Simon had managed to finally release himself from the restrictions of the Simon and Garfunkel format. True or not, Simon certainly took his newfound freedom to new heights on the follow-up. There goes rhyming Simon. The album took Simon six months to write and he recorded it over four months in several studios in many different places. When asked why, he replied, I always travel for musicians. Wherever the musicians are, that's where I go. Simon tried out several new co-producers on the album, with Roy Halley only playing a part on two songs. For Ramon co-produced four songs and Paul Samuel Smith one. In search of his American roots, Simon also spent considerable time at the legendary Muscle Shoals Sound Studio in Alabama, with the equally legendary Muscle Shoals rhythm section playing on and producing five of the songs. One of them was the lead single, Kodachrome, which became a huge hit worldwide. Another was Loves Me Like a Rock, which featured the gospel vocal group the Dixie Hummingbirds and reached to number two on the US charts. The incredible quality of the songs on There Goes Rhyming Simon is illustrated by the fact that a total of six singles were released, with Take Me to the Mardi Gras, which features the Onward Brass Band, also having a major impact. Something So Right features a string arrangement by another American legend, Quincy Jones. While American Tune has become a classic that has been covered by Willie Nelson, Dave Matthews, Sean Colvin, and many others. Released in May of 1973, There Goes Rhyming Simon was awarded two Grammy nominations, including for Album of the Year. Simon hit the first creative and commercial peak of his solo career with his next album, Still crazy after all these years. In contrast to his two previous albums, it was mostly recorded in one studio, A&R Recording in New York, and co-produced with only one person, Phil Ramone. It was also more jazz influenced than previous albums. The title track and My Little Town were again recorded with the Muscle Shoals rhythm section. The latter was the last new song Simon and Garfunkel recorded together in the studio. Back in my little town. Still Crazy After All These Years has become one of Simon's classic songs. In a unique and much discussed interview with David Cavett, Simon played an unfinished version of the song and gave an insight into his songwriting process. Still crazy after all these years. Oh. The other major song on the album is 50 Ways to Leave Your Lover, a reference to the breakup of Simon's marriage. The song became his only number one American hit single. Tony Levin plays bass on the track and Steve Gadd, a drum part that has since become famous and has been widely sampled. Simon also recorded a duet with Phoebe Snow on the album called Gone At Last. Still Crazy After All These Years was released in October of 1975 and was enormously successful. It was Simon's first American number one solo album and won him two Grammy Awards, one for Album of the Year. Having reached another career peak with Still Crazy After All These Years, Simon decided to go in a different direction. In this case, Simon simply seemed to loosen the reins a bit on his career, and he would not release another solo album for five years. During those five years, there was a much publicized television duet with George Harrison. Um. 
wish I was homeward bound. Home, where my thoughts are sleeping home. And he enjoyed a top five hit with Slip Sliding Away, a song that was released as part of the Greatest Hits Etc. album. Simon wrote music for a film called Shampoo and did some acting in the Woody Allen movie Annie Hall. Simon's next step was to complete a film script. He also acted in the movie, which was called One Trick Pony, and he released a solo album of the same name in August of 1980. It was his first on Warner Brothers and was again co-produced with Phil Ramone and featured top musicians like Steve Gadd, Tony Levin, guitarist Eric Gell and Joe Beck, brass players Michael and Randy Brecker and many more. One Trick Pony is an excellent album, but with a punk tornado having turned the music world upside down and New Wave the dominant new music form and perhaps also because of his absence of five years, Paul Simon was regarded as less relevant than before. As a result, the album sold far less than its predecessor, despite the fact that Late in the Evening was a number six hit, and a title track and second single funkier than anything Simon had done so far. He's a one -trip pony. One -trip the movie was not well received, and reportedly Simon began to doubt himself. A detour that involved performing the famous concert in Central Park with Garfunkel in 1981 didn't really help alleviate his insecurities, and he developed writer's block that needed the help of a psychiatrist. There was even a plan for a Simon and Garfunkel album, and the two worked for a while in the studio with Roy Halley. However, the collaboration with Garfunkel did not work out, as Simon judged the songs too personal. Instead, he worked on his new solo album with Russ Tuttleman, famous for his work with Eric Clapton and Steve Winwood. Larry Wanaka, who had worked with Ry Kuda, Little Feet and Randy Newman, co-produced another three tracks. Famous session musicians on the album included Nile Rogers, Marcus Miller, Aldo Miola, Ertu Moriera, and several more. The result, Hearts and Bones, was released in November of 1983, and despite several great songs, notably the title track and the late great Johnny Ace, which had a contribution by famous minimalist composer Philip Glass, the album again failed to find commercial success. It only reached number 35 in the Billboard charts and number 34 in the UK. By 1984, Simon had suffered another relationship failure, this time with actress Carrie Fisher, and he commented, I had a personal blow, a career setback, and the combination of the two put me into a tailspin. Career-wise, it appeared as if Simon had joined the ranks of many middle-aged rock artists who had enjoyed their heydays in the 60s and 70s, and now struggled for relevance and had problems keeping up with new trends, by then dominated by the drum machines and synths of the digital revolution. However, rather than semi-retire and rest on his laurels, Simon came up with the most successful, groundbreaking and influential album of his career, Graceland. The seed was sown when he was given a cassette tape called Accordion Jive Volume 2, which contained Ember Canber, also called Township Jive, aka Black Street Music from Soweto in Johannesburg. Simon later commented in an interview, it was very good summer music, happy music. It sounded like very early rock and roll to me, black, urban, mid 50s rock and roll, like the great Atlantic tracks from that period. I was listening to it for fun for at least a month before I started to make up melodies over it. Even then, I wasn't making them up for the purpose of writing. I was just singing along with the tape, the way people do. Simon adored the music and asked Warners to find out who played on it. The label contacted South African producer Hilton Rosenthal, who identified Simon's favourite track as Gumboots by the Boyoyo Boys. Rosenthal sent Simon more tapes with South African music, and he was thinking of using these tracks as the basis for new songs, just like he had done with El Condor Pasa. The idea formed in Simon's head to go to South Africa and work with the musicians that played on the tapes. He commented in 2021, I learned pretty early on, if you want to get the music right, you should probably travel to where it's being played as opposed to asking musicians who are not familiar with it to copy it. Going to South Africa was morally and practically dubious at the time. There was a cultural boycott by the United Nations because of the racist apartheid policy, which Simon would have to violate. However, producer Quincy Jones and singer Harry Belafonte encouraged him, and the South African Black Musicians Union 
accepted his visit, hoping that it would give wider exposure to the nation's black musicians. Simon and Roy Halley traveled to Johannesburg in February of 1985, where they set up Innovation Studios. Roy Halley recalled in an interview in Sound on Sound magazine, it was a good studio. I remember walking in there and thinking, this is the best sounding control room I've ever been in. There was a Harrison console, 3M tape machines, and modified James Lansing monitors. I expected a horror show, but everything worked. The studio itself was like a garage, and in that regard, I thought it could be a problem, especially since we were going to record jam sessions from which songs would be created. The musicians like to work very close together with eye contact to get the feel and the groove going. However, since the songs would be crafted out of these grooves, the instruments had to be isolated so we could do plenty of editing, repairing parts, pulling out a specific guitar, and so on. Everybody in their own little room, behind their own little gobo. Really this is where my experience at Columbia came into play. There were ways of setting up the rhythm section and getting good isolation without putting the musicians in separate little booths with headphones. The right choice of microphones and levels really helps. And in this case, I recorded the musicians with very few baffles, none around the drums, while they stood close together with good eye contact. Nobody wore headphones aside from the drummer, and even he didn't often wear them. Most musicians prefer not to wear headphones because otherwise they have to listen to this mix, which is generally horrible. Everybody's saying, can I hear more of myself? And there's this nightmare going on. Well, I wasn't about to get into that with these people. They were to come in and play and feel comfortable while my job was to get some isolation. Various musicians and singers had been invited for the sessions and paid $200 an hour by Simon, with normal rates in Johannesburg at the time being about $15 an hour. As Haley explained, Simon's idea was to use these backing tracks from the jam sessions to write songs over, and he offered the musicians writing credits and royalties when he felt their writing contributions were essential. The creative process of writing over backing tracks was a new one for Simon, whose process until then was, as he remarked, to sit with the guitar and write a song, finish it, go into the studio, book the musicians, lay out the song and the chords, and then try to make a track. But with these musicians, I was doing it the other way around. The tracks preceded the songs, and instead of resisting what went on, I went with it and was carried along. Instead of assuming that I was the captain of the ship, I was not. I was just a passenger. Simon explained in another interview that the unusual South African rhythms and the fact that musicians rarely play the exact pattern twice meant that he had to learn to listen in a completely new way. Simon's main South African collaborators emerged during these sessions, with guitarist Ray Firi and Bakithi Kamalo playing a fretless Washburn bass, drummer Isaac M. Tashali, and Ladysmith Black Mambazo. Simon called the sessions euphoric, and while also commenting on the underlying tensions related to apartheid. For example, with the musicians needing to be home before a curfew. After two weeks of sessions, Simon and Halley returned to New York to take stock of what they had and edit it, and for Simon to write his top lines. He had already written bits of melodies and lyrics in South Africa, but the challenge was to turn several long jam sessions into complete songs. According to Halley, the amount of editing that went into the album was unbelievable. We recorded everything analog, so it sounded really good, but without the facility to edit digital, I don't think we could have done that project. First thing I did in New York was put everything onto a Sony 3324 digital machine. Then we edited, edited, edited like crazy. I put it back on analog, I put it back on digital, and edited some more. We must have done that at least 20 times. These editing sessions took place at the Hit Factory in New York during April of 1986, with Halley working with an SSL console. Many overdubs were also done at the studio, with Simon flying several of the South African musicians over. Halley recalls, for microphones we had the usual selection of tube Neumann 49s, 87s and 67s. Paul's mic always seemed to end up being a Tube 67 thanks to how it helps with sibilance, enunciation and all-around fullness. I tried different mics with him through the years, but it always went back to the standard M49 or U67. Capturing Paul's vocals is always very, very tough because he's a perfectionist. He would go out and sing the same vocal 15 times and then I'd comp like crazy. 
The first single of the album, You Can Call Me Al, was recorded entirely at the Hip Factory with a blend of American and South African musicians. Adrian Ballou played a guitar synth and the legendary Randy Brecker was one of the trumpet players. The rhythm section consists of the core South African band, Ray Firi, Bakifi, Kamalo and Isaac M. Tashali. Kamalo provided a spectacular bass part. Other recording sessions took place at Abbey Road Studios in London, where Lady Smith Black and Barzo recorded Homeless, which was co-written by Simon and Joseph Shambhala. Simon and Halley also went to Amigo Studios in Los Angeles, where Linda Ronstadt added vocals on Under African Skies. And Los Lobos recorded the closing track for the album, All Around the World or The Myth of Fingerprints. Roy Halley commented, Throughout the Graceland project, I tried to capture the integrity of the South African sound, not my own sound, and managed to pick up some of their very interesting ideas. One of these was that they'd use a small amount of very short chamber on the bass, and it was great. It worked very well with Bikiti's fretless bass. I put all kinds of tape reverb and delay on the synth bass line as well to make it do more than it actually was doing. I used three or four tape machines with different tape delays. Oh, see, there's an overdub on the bass. Second, oh, oh, two basses happening. Halley also added tape delay to Simon's rhythmically complex vocals on You Can Call Me Al. I had a tape delay feeding the left channel and a different delay feeding the right. Remove that tape delay from You Can Call Me Al and with all of the sibilants, pops and other little mouth noises against what was going on in the track, the vocal would be unintelligible. Graceland was mixed in the same control room in the Hip Factory in New York where the editing and some of the recordings had taken place, with Halley taking two days to mix each song because of the complexity of the sessions. Halley has also admitted to still having doubts because it would have been such a lengthy difficult project and the music was so different to what was on the charts. Meanwhile, Warner Brothers had long written off Simon's album as a vanity project and given that his first two albums on the label had flopped, the label had started to assume that they had made the wrong decision in signing him. However, the end result was, in the words of The Boy in the Bubble, an album of miracle and wonder. Graceland was released in August of 1986 and it was immediately clear that Simon had managed to pull off one of the most remarkable artistic and political triumphs of the 20th century. The amazingly fresh and vibrant sound of the album, with great songs and the stunning and completely new South African sounds, were instrumental in convincing almost everyone that the album was not exploitative, but instead a perfect vehicle for bringing South African music and musicians to the world. As the album took the world by storm and famous South African musicians like Hugh Masakela and Miriam Makeba expressed support, the political objections began to sound like sour grapes. Graceland and Simon were seemingly everywhere in 1986 and 87, and the album went to number one in many countries, including the UK. It sold more than 16 million copies worldwide and has become part of popular culture. Graceland won the Grammy Award for Album of the Year, while the title song received a Grammy for the Record of the Year. The album also launched the international careers of many of the South African musicians involved, in particular Ladysmith Black Mambazo. The enormous artistic and commercial success of Graceland was not easy to repeat. Simon tried in 1989 with the album The Rhythm of the Saints, which was largely recorded in Rio de Janeiro, and explored Brazilian music in the same way as Graceland was based on South African music. Released in October of 1990, the album was a commercial success, though far less so than Graceland, and it received a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year. However, the general feeling was that the whole of the Rhythm of the Saints did not exceed the sum of the excellent parts in the same way as its predecessor. On August the 15th, 1991, Simon performed a concert in Central Park that featured several of the South African and South American musicians he had worked with on his two previous albums. The concert was attended by 750,000 people. And a live album and concert film documenting the event, Paul Simon's Concert in the Park, was released in November of 1991. Simon's next album did not appear until 1997. Simon had begun working on a musical called The Cape Man as far back as 1988 and eventually finished the script with playwright Derek Walcott. Simon put a band together and the recordings for the songs took five years and cost a million dollars. The show and the album, Songs from the Cape Man, released in November of 1997, were both commercial and critical failures. 
with the show losing $11 million. Simon tried to revive his stalling career with You're the One, which was released in October of 2000. The album is a blend of Simon's characteristic, imitable, folk-influenced songwriting and the South American and South African influences from the previous solo albums. The album was a moderate commercial and critical success, even earning Simon a Grammy Award for Album of the Year. The first time I saw her, I couldn't... It took six years for Simon's next album to appear, called Surprise, the collaboration with the legendary Brian Eno, known for his work with Bowie, Roxy Music, U2 and the Talking Heads, as well as being the father of ambient music, was indeed a surprise. The album was recorded in at least eight major studios, and Eno provided electronics and sonic landscapes to 10 of the 11 songs on the album. One of the highlights is Outrageous, which contains the line, Who's gonna love you when your looks are gone? Which is memorable because, well, it's probably a thought that crosses most people's minds at some point. However, it was the 11th track on the album, Father and Daughter, that became a Simon classic. He had written it in 2002 for the animated The Wild Thornberrys movie. It received an Oscar nomination for Best Original Song. Surprise was released in May of 2006 and earned Simon another Grammy nomination for Album of the Year. Simon reunited with Phil Ramone for his 12th solo album, So Beautiful or So What? It marked a radical departure in two respects. First of all, it was written and largely recorded at his home studio. And secondly, after more than 25 years of writing to backing tracks, it marked the first time since Hearts and Bones in 1983 that Simon wrote songs again with just him singing with an acoustic guitar. The studio in Simon's cottage around 2010 was well equipped with microphones like a Bock Audio 251. Various high voltage DPA mics, Royer 122V, SF24, and 121s, as well as mics by Neumann, Shaw, Sennheiser, and AKG. There was also mic pre's by Telefunken, Great River, Grace, Chandler, and API, and compressors by Purple Audio, Chandler, API, and Teletronics. It is at its heart a Pro Tools HD system, with plugins by Isotope, Massenberg, Sound Toys, Eventide, Sonox, and Audio Ease and two Apogee AD16Xs and one DA16X converters, an Antelope Audio Master Clock and Adam S3A monitors. According to Ramon, the arrangements and overdubbing process were framed by Simon's desire that So Beautiful or So What would not sound like a studio album. He wanted to have lots of space with lots of atmosphere and feeling, so rather than go for hugely orchestrated ideas, he was going, for example, for overtones, in bells and gongs. Simon explained his reasoning. I keep trying to eliminate sounds that I don't like. On this record I said, I don't like most of the echo sounds that I hear coming out of the technology. So I started using bells and the decaying sound of the bells behind lines. It sort of sounded like an echo, but it was a strange tonality and it created a sound that was atmospheric. And that was what I was looking for. Pilgrim on a pilgrimage, walked across the Brooklyn Bridge. According to engineer and mixer Andy Smith, we used the Sound Deluxe 251, now called Bock Audio, on Paul's voice, going into a Telefunken V76, and then the Purple Audio or an LA-2A, in some cases both. The way we recorded the acoustic guitars varied. Paul has many guitars, so that determined what mic we used. Sometimes I'd use the DPA high voltage mics like the 4003 small diaphragm or the 40 41T2 large diaphragm tube mic. I usually place the microphone aimed at the 12th fret. The DPAs are omnidirectional mics, so you get right up close to the guitar and get all the subtleties of the playing without having to worry about the proximity effect. Some of the high voltage mics have their own power supply and some require specific 130 volt mic pre's, for which we would use both Grace and Millennia mic pre's. It typically went directly into the purple audio compressor or sometimes an LA-2A or an API or a Chandler LTD compressor. We use compression for color. Paul also used many of his pedals while playing acoustic, going into an amp, and we would later on sometimes reamp guitar tracks, putting them through some guitar pedals. So Beautiful or So What was released in April of 2011 and was Simon's most commercially successful album since The Rhythm of the Saints 21 years previously reaching number four in the Billboard album charts. Simon reunited with Roy Halley for his 13th solo album, 
stranger to stranger. Halley had already retired and was unfamiliar with Pro Tools, so his role as co-producer was to advise Simon with others, including the singer, manning the Pro Tools rig at his home. Stranger to Stranger is one of Simon's most experimental albums, blending electronic beats with a wide variety of sounds and instruments. These included instruments made by avant-garde composer Harry Parch, who did his most significant work in the middle of the 20th century. Simon commented Parch had a totally different approach to what music is and had to build his own instruments so he could compose on a microtonal scale. That microtonal thinking pervades this album. The latest shift in direction exemplifies Simon's ethos, which he once described as, my whole artistic life has always been about change, change, change. Move on, move on. It is the only thing I find interesting. Stranger to Stranger was released in June of 2016 and well received critically. One critic called it a five star tour through new sounds. It had a similar impact on the charts as its predecessor, reaching number three in the US album charts and number one in the UK. In 2018, at the age of 76, Simon announced his retirement from touring. He conducted a farewell tour with his last concert on September the 22nd, 2018, taking place in Queens, New York, the place where he had grown up. Simon had since then occasionally appeared on stage for guest performances. Simon and Halley again collaborated on in the Blue Light, an album that contained reinterpretations of songs from Simon's back catalogue that Simon felt did not quite get the attention they deserved. Famous musicians like Brill Frizzell, Steve Gadd, John Patitucci, Winter Marsalis, Jack de Jeanette, and many others, mostly active in the jazz genre, shed brilliant new light on many semi-forgotten gems. But she's so cool, I'm not. The album was released in September of 2018. Five years and a pandemic later, in June, Seven Psalms was released. Simon's first album of new material since 2016. It was sparked by a dream Simon had. The album is entirely acoustic, with Seven Psalms segued into a single 33 minute long piece. Simon played most of the instruments and is assisted by British vocal ensemble Voches 8, Winter Marsalis and his wife singer-songwriter Edie Brickell. Carl Krishman engineered and co-produced Seven Psalms and were releasing a separate video about its making. The Seven Psalms album comes across like a coda to an already rich, incredibly long career. And with Simon at now 81 and in recent interviews explaining that he has lost most hearing in one ear, it is very likely to be his last release. If so, it will conclude a remarkable career. For 66 years, we've been able to enjoy not so much the sound of silence, but the sound of Paul Simon one of the best songwriters who ever lived, who has created some of the most enduring songs of all time and albums that changed music forever. They are achievements that very few people can better. Simon and Garfunkel was in my home. I think we had four or five pop albums that my dad deemed it necessary for us to have. And one of those, of course, was The Sounds of Silence. And then, as a little kid growing up in the 70s, there was a greatest hits that came out in Britain of Simon Garfunkel. And then, of course, there was the Central Park concert, which I think any kid alive at that time will just remember vividly. And we all bought the accompanying album. And then, of course, Graceland happened. And all during that period, I'm going back. I'm getting Rosemary, you know, I'm getting all of the albums. I'm discovering everything about it. When I think of classic, great, incredible songwriters, he's in that top five or six songwriters of all time. And as we're doing this video, I'm like, oh God, that song, that song, that song, that song, that song, that song. You just keep, you can't help realizing that he has hundreds of bleeding, amazing songs. Very, very few songwriters can come close to that. So at 81 years old, and to do an album where you're losing your hearing that badly, and do an album that's so vulnerable, is pretty darn amazing. Paul Simon, thank you for the amazing music. We really appreciate it. Thank you everybody for watching. Please leave any comments and questions below. We would love to hear any suggestions that you might have for future videos. Thanks everyone. So long, farewell. Dovidenia, goodbye. Tschüss.